Hello, everybody. Welcome to the first session of the Euro online seminar series on operational research and machine learning. Before starting with the, the first talk of today, I would like to, to go back a little bit in time. And uh, a few years ago, during the sad times of uh, pandemics, uh, Dolores, Dolores Romero Morales and myself, together with our PC students at the time, we started an initiative, which was the online seminar series on machine learning needs mathematical optimization within a, an European project that uh, Dolores was leading. And this was uh, a good opportunity to, to maintain the scientific network in these times in which we were forced to, to stay at home. We were uh, very, very lucky. And we were very lucky because when we invited our colleagues, top researchers all around the world to, to give uh, talks. And uh, uh, we asked them also to be uh, recorded, to have the, the record of the uh, of their talks. They immediately accepted. And we are also very lucky because we had many, many people attending all these, uh, all these lectures. Time flies, and uh, the project is, uh, needs project is, uh, around to, to its end. In the meanwhile, we had the chance of having the, the support of Europe as, uh, because our uh, online seminar series uh, became an instrument for uh, branding uh, operations research uh, outside the, the world of operations research. And now today, we can say that we have been even luckier because Euro has created an instrument, the Euro online seminar series, which I'm pretty sure is gonna be as useful as all the other instruments Euro has for the operations research community. We are very thankful then for all the uh, speakers we have uh, now in the list for this uh, session, for this uh, uh, series of uh, sessions in the Euro online seminar series on operational research and machine learning. We hope that you can count with your uh, with your presence in, in all our uh, lectures. Nevertheless, they are going to be recorded. So in case you cannot make it, uh, remember that uh, they will be available to, to, to follow them offline. And we are, as I have said, quite uh, grateful to Euro, the Association of European Operational Research Societies for its support in the past and especially now in this new instrument. And since we are uh, these uh, words I'm saying about Euro are not in abstract because we have the the honor of having today to to declare open this uh, online seminar series, this Euro online seminar series, to the president of Europe. So Anita, Professor Anita Schubel, thank you very much uh, on behalf of all the organizers for the support we we are receiving from from Euro to organize this event. And uh, thanks for being here today to, to make the official inauguration of our uh, Euro online seminar series. The floor is yours. Thanks, Emilio, and thanks, Dolores, for inviting me to say a few words to the opening of this session. A warm welcome to all of you for the Euro online seminar series on operational research and machine learning. And it is the very first Euro OSS, as Emilio just said. And I'm very happy to have a chance to open the very first Euro OSS today. So Euro OSS are a lot of abbreviations and words. So I will have two questions that I want to answer now. What is Euro and what is OSS? So Euro is the Association of Oper European Operational Research Societies. Don't mix it up with the money. We have at the moment 31 operations research societies, national operations research societies that belong to Euro. Not all of them are located in Europe, but they all belong to our group of Euro, which is a subgroup of IFORS, of the International Federation of Operations Research. We run 34 working groups at the moment. You see them listed here. The newest one is quantum, quantum computing, or operations research in quantum computing, and you're all invited to join. 
And we have conferences and journals. So the next conference, maybe put it into your calendar, is the Euro 2025 in Leeds, where we also celebrate our 50th anniversary. And we run four journals in, at the Euro. The most known one is the European Journal of Operational Research. But we also have three more journals that now got very good citations also and good marks. That is the Euro Journal on Computational Optimization, on decision processes, and on transportation and logistics. That was Euro. Now, what is an OSS? As Emilio already said, it is a series, of an online seminar series, and it is exactly what you do here. So it is a series of online seminars, talks, and discussions. And as already said in the beginning, starting from autumn 2024, so right now, Euro supports such a series of online seminars as Euro OSS if some things are satisfied. First, the topic needs to be relevant for operations research. And second, the seminar series should be organized by some engaged OR persons. And I want to mention that this new instrument of Euro has been set up thanks to the successful online seminar series that Dolores and Emilio have been running since the Corona times. So thanks very much for that. As Emilio already said, we think it is a very useful instrument and opens the floor for also other, hopefully as successful series as yours. So now you applied to become an open seminar series on operational research and machine learning. And the question was, do you qualify as Euro Open Seminar Series? We discussed that in the Euro Executive Committee. And the opinion of us is that machine learning needs operations research, as we have learned in preceding seminar series of you, that operations research needs machine learning, and that this should be made visible. And there's no better tool to do that as such an online seminar series and it is not only related to operations research, your topic is really highly relevant for operations research. So put it in short, yes, certainly you qualify for the first Euro online seminar series, and we are more than happy to support you as Euro online, Euro online seminar series on operations research and machine learning. And before I end, I have a small request for everybody who is listening at the moment. Euro will have its 50th anniversary next year. So Euro will be 50 years old on the 27th January 2025 because Euro has been founded on the 27th January 1975. And we would like to use this opportunity to raise the awareness for operations research. And it would be a great help if you support us with your social media accounts. Maybe you can congratulate Euro on the 27th January next year. Maybe you want to share pictures, videos, or posts about operations research. And please feel free to mention the, your favorite talks in, your, in this open seminar series and mention the Euro open seminar series as a whole. Would be very helpful for us and maybe also raise the attention to you. And for now, I wish you great talks for the start of the series, fruitful discussions, and that you bring our favorite disciplines forward together. And again, a big thank you to Dolores, Emilio, and their team for running the series, to all the speakers, and to all of you attending the talks. And now I leave the floor to Bart, but before Bart you start, I think Dolores will give some introductory word about you. Thanks for joining. Thank you so much, uh, Anita, for the very kind words and also for the celebration uh, next year of Euro. Uh, so um, now it's time for us to introduce the first speaker. Uh, as usual, you know, when you go around and search for speakers, uh, I can tell you that the one that we have today uh, said uh, yes, as usual, you know, immediately. He has always been very, very helpful in many of the endeavors in which uh, Emilio and I have put him. Um, so I'm very, very pleased uh, that he will be uh, our first speaker. It would be long for me to give, um, say, a thorough biography of Bart because it's very ample. So I'm just going to highlight a few things. And first of all, um, yeah, he is a full professor at the KU Leuven 
and he's also a lecturer at the University of Southampton. So what he has been doing in his uh, research career is to basically advance uh, methods and applications of operations research, um, particularly in areas concerning data science, so very relevant to, um, to our Euro online seminar series. And key areas in which has, he has been uh, contributing to are analytics, credit risk modeling, and fraud detention, which is the topic of today. So he has key publications in these areas, as well as uh, textbooks that are used in teaching um, um, across the world. So he has received many awards and honors. So I would like to mention in this uh, setting, um, the prizes that he has got for best uh, European Journal of Operational Research paper in the Euros in 2014 and the Euro of 2017. He has also received prizes from the OR Society. He's listed in the Stanford University new data set of top scientists in the world on the two percentage. So I think I'm giving you an idea that we are uh, um, um, having a very um, special speaker today. And it's not only that he basically works in his own research, but he also contributes, uh, say, to the community by uh, being in some of the well-known journals in the editorial board and by organizing special issues, uh, as he has done recently, for example, for EJA. He's also very successful uh, with fundraising from the private and the uh, public sector, but I must say that I leave it there. Maybe I can say that he's also a very, very um, keen on football. So it's something that he will become relevant at the end of this talk today. And so Bart, uh, we are extremely happy of having you today here and the floor is yours. For, by the way, for the audience, please remember that um, you are muted and your cameras are not showing, but at the very end in the Q&A session, you will be able to ask the questions yourself. Thank you very much, Dolores, for the very kind uh, introduction. Just want to check, uh, can you hear me loud and clear? Uh, perfect. Hi, excellent. So good afternoon, good night, good morning, and good day from wherever you're joining us. Um, first of all, I would like to thank Dolores and Emilio for setting up this wonderful initiative. Um, sometimes it's it's really nice to see the energy that they put into this knowledge dissemination initiative, and um, it's something I really uh, I'm really honored to be part of. So today I want to talk to you about using artificial intelligence for fraud detection, and some of the research insights that I will share are based upon my own research, and I will also try and identify some emerging opportunities. By the way, I only have a limited time span available, so obviously I can only touch upon various things a little bit superficially, but in case you want more in-depth information about any of the topics that I talk about, don't hesitate to send me an email at the email address indicated at uh, on my slide right here. Also, more than happy to share my slides in case you would be interested. So, brief introduction. Uh, prof I'm indeed a professor of AI and business at KU Leuven, lecturer at the University of Southampton. My research center surrounds, used to be called data science analytics, more and more call, referred to as artificial intelligence, but I predominantly study that from an application perspective. That means that I study the applications thereof in fraud analytics, um, credit risk, but also applications such as customer lifetime value. And in doing this, we collaborate with a worldwide network of international organizations, predominantly also financial institutions, uh, insurers, credit card providers, et cetera. In case you would like to stay in touch with some of the research we're doing, you can connect on our dataminingapps.com website. We also feature a two-weekly newsletter. And besides that, I also have various types of books that I've written. The most relevant for this talk is probably the Fraud Analytics book that I co-authored um, co with two of my ex-PhD students, uh, Veronique van Vlasselaar and Professor Wouter Verbeke, who's now also a professor at the Catholic University of Leuven here with me. I also have my own online learning platform in case you'd be interested. 
We feature various types of online learning courses on the platform, all related to applications of analytics, artificial intelligence, in credit risk modeling, in fraud detection. And part of the revenue that we generate by selling those courses is being invested in oceans that, in companies that clean up our precious oceans from plastics. So in case you're interested, feel free to check this out as well. So what I want to do in this very condensed talk is, first of all, briefly set the stage, then talk about cost-sensitive fraud detection and some of the research contributions that we have in that area. Then talk about the very crucial role of data engineering. We, like one or two years ago, we edited a special issue of the machine learning journal on data engineering um, that is getting quite a few citations recently, clearly indicating the importance thereof. Then I'm gonna talk about social networks, which is also very important in a fraud setting and obviously conclude with some concluding remarks. Now, fraud is um, a very, a very important problem that is being faced by many organizations worldwide. So if you look at some of the estimates put forward by the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners in 2024, they claim that an average firm loses about 5% of its revenue due to fraud each year. Now, that's a quite substantial amount if you translate that in absolute dollar terms. So even if you could cut that amount or reduce that amount from 5% to 4%, that could already be a very significant gain. And it's that gain that we're going to try and realize using state-of-the-art artificial intelligence techniques, which have been appropriately tailored towards the problem specifics of fraud. Likewise, another estimation right there um, that was put forward by Forbes also this year was that insurance fraud costs about $900 per customer. So usually what fraud does in insurance is it, re it increases the, the premium, which is some, something we obviously don't want. Now, if you want to talk about fraud, one of the first things that you typically have to do is to try and put forward a definition. And I was lucky that throughout my career, I have been I've been fortunate enough to collaborate with very smart PhD students. And maybe some of them are attending this talk at this very moment. I didn't check. But um, Veronique was one of those. And when she started working on fraud, I asked her to maybe come up with a definition of fraud. And it's a definition that she wrote down in one afternoon. And it turned out that right now it's one of the most cited definitions of fraud um, that you that, that you might find all in, 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 in the literature. She kind of defined it as an uncommon. So that means obviously fraud is a very rare phenomenon. It means that we're looking for the needle in a haystack. It's a well-considered. Fraud is really intention, intentional. So there's really malicious intent with fraud. It's imperceptibly concealed in the sense that a fraudster is continuously trying to blend into its environment to stay inconspicuous as long as possible. So that means that from an analytical perspective, we have to be very creative when we start talking about uh, how to engineer features that will help us detect fraud. Fraud is obviously time evolving, changes. So new technologies bring about new opportunities to do fraud. Think about large language models and how they can be used to create all kinds of uh, fraudulent schemes. Fraud is sometimes, often even, carefully organized. That means that you have many participants that set up um, collusion practices that set up very malicious practices to conduct fraud. Think about anti-money laundering. We're currently collaborating with BNP Paribas Fortis on anti-money laundering and how we can detect anti-money laundering schemes within their data. And obviously it appears in many types and forms, credit card fraud, insurance fraud, anti-money laundering, and so on. So here you can see some of the um, types of fraud. It's by no means meant to be um, an exhaustive enumeration of all the types of fraud. But in red, you can see the applications of fraud that me and my team have worked on in the past. And in case you would like to have any specific information on any of those, happy to give you uh, more details. So if we worked on credit card fraud, we worked on corruption. We're currently doing work on insurance fraud, currently doing work on anti-money laundering. In the past, we've also worked on tax evasion. Together with the Belgian government, we developed a social network analytical system to detect tax evasion. Uh, we worked with BNP Paribas on payment transaction fraud, also in red, and we worked with um, KBC, which is another well-known Belgian and actually European financial institution on workers' compensation fraud. So you can see that fraud is a really um, 
uh, omnipresent phenomenon that you encounter in many different types and shapes. Now, the first thing that you're going to try and do if you set up, if you want to do fraud management, is you're going to start with some very preliminary attempt at fraud uh, detection. And usually, the very first attempts at fraud detection were based on a set of if-then business rules. That means that they were based upon expert knowledge, fraud investigators that have worked for years in the field, and that kind of had a pretty good feeling about what were the fraud patterns that um, the fraudsters were adopting. Now, thanks to digitalization, uh, or I should say due to digitalization and emerging technologies, those patterns became more and more complicated. So that means that we needed to have more and more advanced methods, oftentimes analytically inspired, to help us detect fraud. So what... Once you start from those business if-then rules, and if one of the transactions or claims is flagged as fraudulent, this is followed by a fraud investigation step. Closer inspection of the claim of the transaction to verify whether it's fraudulent, yes or no. If yes, then we have a fraud confirmation and we can set up fraud prevention schemes. And actually, if yes, we can also feed the observation back to the original fraud detection system as such setting up some kind of self-reinforcement loop in order to try to continuously uh, detect or confirm existing, uh, detect new fraud patterns or confirm existing fraud patterns as they have been written down. The thing with AI is that we're going to try and do this by leveraging all kinds of various sources of data that we have available, both structured data as well as unstructured data. And if you look at a fraud detection system, you can, you can evaluate its performance in various types of ways. Statisticians will often think in terms of hit rate, like how many of the, uh, uh, how many of the fraudsters do we actually catch? They will look at lift, rate, lift curves, they will look at recall, how many of the fraudsters do we get, and precision, how many of the labeled observations that, are, that we consider to be fraudulent are actually fraudulent. So these are statistical accuracy measures that oftentimes have been used to evaluate the performance of analytical fraud methods. But in fraud detection, it's also very important to have interpretability because it's very important to understand the mechanisms uh, behind fraud and how certain fraudsters are conducting their malicious activities. And I know Dolores and Emilio, for example, have done recently some very exciting work on, on making um, AI or um, machine learning models more interpretable. Sometimes operational efficiency is also a key concern, especially when you talk about credit card transaction fraud. <laughs> Uh, and credit card transaction fraud, we see that occurring quite a lot. Like half an hour ago, I was called, I was actually te uh, teaching about fraud analytics about an hour ago. So uh, it was an hour ago. I was called by a German firm to verify a so-called um, dodgy transaction on my credit card of 2,500 euro. Now, it was quite obvious that this call was part of a fraudulent setup, and I've been victim of that a few times. I didn't lose any money because I kind of had a suspicion that this was fraudulent. So the fraudsters become more and more advanced in setting up their practices, and especially in credit card fraud detection, operational efficiency is really very important. Because if you suspect that a credit card transaction is fraudulent, you want to block it as soon as possible. In the past, for example, in our past collaboration with credit card providers, providers, uh, we once were faced with an eight second rule where we were able, uh, where we had to deploy um, our analytical system in such a way that within eight seconds, the system could make a decision whether a transaction was fraudulent, yes or no. And oftentimes this could mean that you have to sacrifice part of the statistical accuracy in return for operational efficiency. So you oftentimes have a, a trade-off between those different types of um, key success factors. What's also very important and that we center most of our research around is obviously profit, how much profit or cost savings is a fraud detection model going to bring about. And obviously, especially in Europe with the EU AI Act, um, with the EU DSA Act, regulatory compliance and GDPR obviously is also um, uh, more and more an issue.
Okay, so what are some of the uh, challenges? Imbalanced data in credit card, we often have less than 0.5% of the transactions that are fraudulent. We're looking at a needle in a haystack, so that means that we're, we have to do some really careful data engineering and tailor the data in such a way that we facilitate it for the analytical models to find meaningful patterns discrimi discriminating the fraudsters from the legitimate transactions. Oftentimes, uh, or almost all of the times, we have asymmetric misclassification costs, right? What about missing a fraudster versus harassing a good customer by blocking their accounts? Nobody wants their credit card account to be blocked when it's not needed, right? Because it's not handy and it will create customer dissatisfaction, customer frustration. While you're in certain types of fraud applications, you're typically also faced with noisy labels particularly in insurance fraud. Like in insurance fraud, you, when a claim is, in, is fraudulent, yes or no, sometimes the insurance provider has a very high suspicion that a claim is fraudulent, but can never be 100% certain unless they do a thorough um, uh, uh, um, investigation and they, uh, they engage into legal proceedings, right? Um, that means that the labels, the target label, fraud, yes or no, on which we're going to train our models can, in certain types of settings, such as insurance fraud, can be noisy. And then there's the operational efficiency with the eight second rule, as I already explained earlier on in credit card fraud detection. Here you can see the whole analytics AI process model, and I'm not going to go through it. I'm just going to roughly divide it into identifying the business problems. So like we want to detect credit card fraud, we want to detect car insurance fraud, we want to detect counterfeit, then identifying the data. And the rule of thumb there is the more data, the better. Definitely, if you can also add some unstructured data, we see a lot of unstructured data also getting more and more important in fraud detection. Think about car insurance fraud where imagery where you can see a picture of the damage that was inflicted to the car can also be an input to detect whether a claim is fraudulent, yes or no. Then cleaning the data, which is all the classical cleaning stuff, transforming the data is something that is so is something that is especially very important because there you want to do the feature engineering. There the creativity kicks in because there you want to come up with some very creative features that will try to distinguish the few fraudsters you have from the many legitimate customers or transactions that you have. So that's where some of the magic is taking place in modern day fraud detection systems. It's in the feature engineering step. Uh, and once you've done that very carefully, you can go and analyze fraud either in a supervised way. That means that you have labels available like you have in the small picture right there, or in an unsupervised way, which means that you're really looking for the anomalies that are in your data and that could potentially signal uh, fraudsters. And then at the end of the day, we want to interpret the analytical fraud models because we want to do fraud prevention and we want to deploy them. And what's there very important is that in fraud detection, I think it was David Hans that once said that as soon as you put an analytical model in production, uh, it's lagging behind the facts because um, it's outdated, because the patterns that you observe in real life are constantly changing. And this particularly pertains to fraud detection because the stakes are so high there. The fraudsters are really tempted to continuously beat your analytical model and to outsmart your analytical model find the loopholes of your analytical model, even steal it using modern day model theft or model stealing practices by repetitive, repetitively calling the model API, for example, and try to figure out how the model works in order to find the loopholes and do the fraudulent activities. So in other words, in this whole overview, the key challenges are identifying the business problem, then the feature engineering that I'm going to come back to in a moment, and then the interpretation, evaluation, and deployment. So not that much in analyzing the data because we have some very good state-of-the-art techniques like XGBoost or isolation forests, which are unsupervised, that allow us to do supervised or unsupervised fraud detection. Now... Traditional classification performance measures that are being used in fraud detection are accuracy, sensitivity, or recall, like how many of the fraudsters did we, do we actually recall in our predictions, uh, how, precision, how pre precise are our predictions, so the ones that we labeled as 
fraudulent, how many of them are actually fraudulent, area under the ROC curve or area under the precision recall curve, those are all important, but they are statistical measures, right? It would be nice if we could also factor in some of the business economics into the problem statement. And that's where I think me and our group, uh, because I work with a group of professors like Professor Verbeke, Professor Jochen de Wiet, who is also uh, uh, doing uh, quite do, doing some work in fraud detection and often contributing to the um, to this initiative. Um, what we try to do is we try to um, emphasize the business aspect of the fraud detection. And one way of doing that is by factoring in the costs and looking at if we predict the transaction to be legit or fraudulent and contrast it with the actual status, whether it's legit or fraudulent, what are the cost asymmetries that pop up? Well, if we predict a transaction as legit, and actually it's legit, it means we're going to pass it, right? So that means that the cost is zero. If we predict it as legit, we're going to pass it, it was actually fraudulent, then we consider the cost to be the amount of the transaction, because that's the amount that you lose. If we predict it to be fraudulent, then obviously we have a cost that is associated with it. If, if it's a legit transaction, then it's an administrative cost, the cost for investigating the claim, the transaction, and finding out that it's actually then legit. Or the actual, in, in case it's actually also positive, obviously we have the same cost because each time we investigate a transaction uh, to find out more about um, uh, its actual status. So that means what we can now factor in all these cost asymmetries into our model. And what we start off, we start off with a set of transactions, typically unbalanced credit card transactions. This could be money transfers in an anti-money money laundering setup. It can be insurance claims. And we have a model. And the state-of-the-art models in, in fraud detection that work on structured data are models like Random Forest, XG Boost, CAD Boost, and so on. So they're typically ensemble models that are then often complemented with Shapley values to, to shed some light on their internal functions. In this case, we're going to go for a logistic regression model because it actually tells us a lot. It's a white box model, and we're going to try and directly factor in um, some of the cost asymmetries right there. So what we do is we have a model that that generates a predicted label, fraud or legitimate for each transaction, money transfer, insurance claim, and so on. And that will then allow us, using this cost matrix right here, to come up with a cost formula that, right here that takes into account the model prediction, CI, and YI, which is the actual target as being legitimate or fraudulent. So based upon this cost, here you can see the entire cost function. And based upon this cost matrix right here, this function collapses to the formula which we have right here, which has also been contributed by a good friend, colleague, researcher, Alejandro Correa Vanson in earlier work. Now, what we did then was we did we considered all kinds of information that we wanted to use to predict a transaction as fraud, yes or no. And again, the more information you can use, the better, because you're giving the analytical model more opportunities to find anything meaningful. So in our case, we looked at the amount of transaction, timestamp, some information on the originator, information on the beneficiary, and we packed that into a vector, into a predictor vector X, which we're then going to use to actually calculate our fraud score. And the fraud score was basically the result of a sigmoid or logistic transformation, because then we have probabilities that are between 0 and 1. And we used the logistic regression and model formulation because um, it allowed us to give some interpretability into the internal mechanics of what is driving fraud. But the only thing that we're going to do now is instead of optimizing the logistic regression using a classical statistically inspired maximum likelihood function, what we're going to do is we're going to actually optimize it directly by factoring in the cost. So what we do is we factor in the cost, the cost as um, I defined them earlier on, and just like you often do with logistic regression when you have quite a lot of predictors, you're going to add a, a regularization term. So here we have a lasso regularization term that we added to the objective function, which kind of squeezes the coefficients to keep on small values so as to avoid overfitting for, from taking place. 
Uh, the way we did this is then we minimized this objective functions. This is the cost function, taking in the cost function that we had earlier on, where we the SI are the scores that are being outputted by the logistic regression. And then we had the let's do regularization term right there to minimize that. We did that using gradient descent, which is the standard procedure that is also being used by large language models nowadays, but then deployed across multiple GPUs. We didn't need GPUs to do that, to do our, our, our particular type of research. But that meant that we had needed to have the gradient components, and these are the gradient components that have actually are the gradient of each of the towards each of the coefficients, which allowed us to do the gradient descent. And what we started off with is we started off with the traditional logistic regression point, right? Which is the traditional, here we have two coefficients, by the way, and this is a traditional logistic regression optimization, optimized using maximum likelihood optimization. And we then navigate it downwards using this previous gradient step by step in a gradient descent way and what you can see is that the traje trajectory that we followed you can see the trajectory outlined here brings us to another set of coefficients so it kind of says that the coefficients that you find in a classical logistic regression are very different to the coefficients that you would find that in a logistic regression setup where you're going to minimize costs hence amplifying the needs and um, the power of doing cost sensitive logistic regression and factoring in directly the costs in the estimation of your analytical fraud model. And then obviously we will also factor in the economic aspects in the decision making to decide whether a transaction is fraud, yes or no. We factor in the administrative costs of investigating the transaction and then also the expected loss, taking into account the fraud score that is being output by the logistic regression and the fraud amount, whereby obviously if we predict the transaction of fraud if the administrative cost is lesser than the expected loss, uh, which we have right here, which brings us to this cost sensitive threshold. So that's the first extension that we did, um, bringing in the economics into the cost formulation. And that's something that we've not only done in fraud detection, but we've also done it in customer churn, for example. So we developed also uh, a cost sensitive extension of logistic regression, but uh, focused on customer churn, right? Customer churn means customers leaving your organization and opting for another firm. Um, and we also had an extension of decision trees, which instead of maximizing uh, the gain or minimizing the entropy or impurity in the data, directly optimize profit. And we have open source uh, implementations available of, of ProfLogit and Prof3, um, of which you see the publications right here on GitHub in case you would be interested. Now, First aspect is about fraud detection, but a second important aspect relates to carefully engineering the data. That means preparing the data in the most optimal way such that you give the maximal opportunity for the analytical model to find meaningful patterns. And when I say data engineering, uh, we're looking at structured data in this particular case. Um, data engineering is also important for unstructured data. I can I can say more about that, but we don't have I only have a limited time span. So here I'm, we're referring to instance engineering. That means that you're looking at uh, the, the observations themselves, and you want to amplify the importance of the fraudsters to make sure that your model finds them, detects them. But it also looks at the creativity of your feature engineering. Your predictors that you're going to use. So be very clever and especially very creative when it comes to feature engineering and finding those features that allow you to enrich the data set and allow the analytical model to find more meaningful patterns. So here, this is the original distribution. We start off with a few fraudsters, long not fraudsters. We can oversample the fraudsters. I'm not a big fan of that. I'm more of a fan of undersampling or some very specific um, tailored approaches, like we've got in our um, experimental collab in our empirical collaborations with uh, various types of financial institutions and insurance providers, we got very good um, experiences with synthetic minority oversampling or sm the smoothie technique. That means that you've got to craft um, artificial observations, which are combinations of existing observations. In other words, you're adding synthetic fraudsters to the data set 
synthetic frosters because that gives you more variability, right? That gives you more heterogeneity between the frosters. And by doing so, you create, uh, you improve the, the richness of the data set and as such, uh, which as such will contribute to better analytical fraud detection models. That's what Smoothie is going to do. We've done some benchmarking studies on that. We've done some empirical studies on that using a plethora of data sets um, in churn prediction, but also in fraud detection. And there's been very there's been very uh, specific techniques that have been developed besides um, the ones that we also developed, like Robros. But for those practitioners that attend the talk, I can tell you that undersampling and smoothie is usually very good. Usually empirically gives you amongst the best performances when you're dealing with skewed data sets, either in a churn or in a fraud detection setup. Um, okay, so then that's the instance engineering part. Then we have the feature engineering part. What we're doing right here is we're looking at crafting inputs, which we call features, that allow us uh, to achieve better predictive performance or interpretability. So interpretability or predictive performance as it is measured either in terms of statistical criteria or cost. And obviously that pretty much relates to the domain that you're working in. So it's some domain specific engineering like RFM, recency of the transaction, frequency, monetary values. Time is also a particularly important feature to characterize because if this is like a time distribution of when I use my credit card, let's say that I start using my credit card at 5 p.m. in the, in, the, in the evening to make purchases on Amazon or Alibaba or any type of, type of online retailer, and the latest I make my my um, uh, purchases are 4 a.m. I usually I'm, I'm I'm in bed by 4 a.m. in the morning anyway. But anyway, let's say let's say that this would be the case. So what you see here is a circular histogram of when a certain type of person makes his or her credit card transactions. That's a time distribution, and that can be very helpful in detecting fraud. But the problem is that time is a very discontinuous variable because at 12 o'clock, a new day starts. So we cannot just average all those timestamps because if you would average those timestamps, you'd probably have a value which is somewhere around 2 p.m. in the afternoon, which is nowhere near uh, a timing when this person made um, credit card transactions. So that means that when you engineer time as a feature to add to your analytical credit card detection, fraud detection models, you have to be very careful and come up with special types of distributions like what we used in our research, which is like a von Mises distribution. That's a periodic normal distribution wrapped around a circle that allows us in this circular um, histogram to develop a 95% confidence interval indicated by the, by the orange lines and indicating when transactions are most likely to take place. And when a transaction, takes place outside this 95% confidence interval, then obviously you have a suspicion of fraud, right? And that can add to the predictors of your data set. Um, I'm going to quickly go. I have a few more minutes left and then hopefully take some questions as well because I need to leave at around 5.30, 5.35 the latest. Um, what's also very interesting to see in certain types of applications of fraud is the so-called Benford's law and Benford's law that means that if you take a random set of numbers for example from a newspaper so you open up a newspaper and all the numbers that you find like stock prices like profits that were made or whatever kind of number that you find in a newspaper like transfers of, uh, of, of, of soccer players and the amounts thereof etc and you write down the you look at the first digit of those numbers. Well, intuitively, you might expect that the first digit is equally likely to be one, two, three, four, up to nine. Well, empirical ex um, evidence has shown that the number one is more, more likely to appear as the first digit than number two, than number three. So it's like a negative exponential uh, that was first found by Benford, by Frank Benford, just before the Second World War. So he found that it's like a negative exponential. So what you can also do if you have a set of numbers, you can try and look at to what extent the first digit distribution deviates from Benford's law. 
And obviously, there are settings where Bedford's law does not apply, but there are also settings where it very strongly applies and where it's used as a um, strong indicator of fraud. Like in the US, deviations from Bedford's law can even be used as legal evidence of fraud. So that's a, a feature that you use that can help you detect fraud. Huh? And again, it's not because it's deviating from Benford's law that it's actually fraudulent, but it can be, it can add to additional evidence that you have collected. And then social networks for fraud. What I'm going to do is I'm going to just talk about some of the recent research. Right now, this morning, we had a conference call with BNP Paribas. And Belgium is known for a couple of things, right? We're known for... Um, for uh, chocolates, right? I was talking with the lawyers about that right before the call. We're uh, known for beer. Actually, the beer, I'm now sitting in my apartment and AB Imbaf, which produces Stella, Hoogarden, Leffy. Actually, the brewery is about just opposite from, from the road right there, right? So uh, about 50 meters away. So in the morning, I can, I can smell the yeast of the beer brewing process. It's not the reason I picked this apartment, but anyway, it's a nice site benefit. But what we're also known for is uh, the, uh, the the Smurfs, right? So you can see this is a Belgian cartoon character. And actually, smurfing is a tactic which is often adopted in anti-money laundering, using either a scatter and gather or a gather and scatter pattern. That means if I want to transfer 1 million euros to um, the account of a, another malicious person, right? Suppose I'm malicious, very hypothetical, obviously, and another malicious person right here. What I'm going to do if I want to transfer 1 million euros, obviously, if I do it in one go, the bank is going to raise a signal. It's going to ask more information. So what, I'm, what I can do is I can chop it up into smaller amounts and use some what we call money mules right here that carry the money for me, hold it temporarily, and then after a certain amount of time, transfer it to the destination account right here. That's what we call a scatter and gather approach. And it's called smurfing because we chop up a big amounts into small smurf alike amounts of money. You can also have gather scatter approaches uh, where you start from multiple small amount, bring it into a, an intermediate stage and which is then distributing it further to target destinations. And some of my PhD students, you know, they can be very creative when they come up with names for algorithms. I don't know whether some of you uh, saw the Smurf cartoon series, but the bad guy that was capturing the Smurfs, and I think he won't actually eat the Smurfs, although I think he never ate a Smurf as far as otherwise I would have. Uh, I think I don't have any trauma from the series, so I think it, it all turned out fine in the end. But um, the PhD student with whom we're doing it, Bruno de Pre, he actually... Um, came up with a very nice name for that, um, Gargamel, which is actually also the name of the bad guy in uh, the cartoon character. Anyway, I have to, um, what we're also obviously doing in, 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 in feature engineering is to construct social networks and engineer those social networks into very clever features. Like a very well-known scheme of dodging taxes in Belgium is a spider construction. A spider construction means that I have a company right here, the key perpetrator of the fraud, which is the black node. It sets up a company right here, puts some resources in there, assigns it a physical address, assigns maybe some physical infrastructure, maybe um, some employees. But this company is not paying its taxes on purpose. So it's not paying its taxes. That means it goes bankrupt. So in bankruptcy, you have two types of bankruptcy. You have a bankruptcy due to financial insolvency, but you can also have bankruptcies because of fraud. This is a fraudulent bankruptcy. Once this one went fraudulent, then all the assets are moved to another company that, again, intentionally goes bankrupt. Not paying its taxes, goes bankrupt, and so on. So you have resources that are being shifted around between those companies, and it's exactly that shift of resources and that sharing of resources that you can try to model using a social network and then featureize in a creative way such that you can add it to all kinds of other types of company-specific characteristics, and that will allow you to better detect those kind of social security fraudulent spider constructions. That's something that we've done uh, with great success together with an ex-PhD student and that turned into a nice publication in management science. And that was used by the Belgian government. 
Recently, I'm also I've also done some work with a colleague, professor, also ex PhD student, also a very smart PhD student, Professor Jochen de Weert, who's now a colleague of mine and another PhD student of mine. That, that was actually a PhD student of Jochen um, and uh, and myself, where we looked at network-based credit card fraud detection using representation learning. So basically, what we did was we looked at a tripartite network. So we enriched the network because the key secret to good social network analytics is to be very creative in the network definition on the one hand and in the featureization on the other hand. So in terms of the network definition, we had three parties. We had a transfer, a money transfer node, which is indicated by the dollar sign. We had a merchant, which you see right here. And then we had a credit card holder right there. Some of these money transfers or credit card payments were fraudulent, as you can see by the Red Cross. Some of them were legitimate. And what we then did was we kind of added an artificial dummy fraudulent node right here that connected all the fraudsters. That was an idea that was framed by the PhD student, Rafael Van Bella, to actually boost the number of fraudsters. And it works a bit similar to what I explained before to Smoothie, synthetic minority oversampling technique. We add a synthetic node that captures information from various other fraudsters in order to also boost the number of fraudulent connections in the network, hoping that the analytical techniques that we're going to unleash on it will also detect more rich patterns. And that turned out the case. That was a very nice um, contribution that Rafael made in his PhD. Obviously, that was then combined with a, an embedding method, deep walk, that, allowed, that allows you to take a node in the network and embed it into a numerical vector that takes into account the structural characteristics of how the node is positioned in the network and to summarize that in a vector. And then we added also some node-specific, customer-specific characteristics like recency, frequency, and monetary. And we built this, we all, co all combined this into a downstream classifier and showed the added performance thereof. And the algorithm was called Catchem. If you want more information or the open source codes uh, available and don't hesitate to let us know it's available on github i'm kind of nearing the end of my talk so we do a lot of um, things on multi-partite social networks uh, also with uh, another ex phd student maria scorsdottir who is a professor at reykjavik university where we look at motor insurance fraud we look at different types of nodes like policyholder, broker, garage, expert, and see how fraud propagates through that network. Um, we have various types of publications on that, which you may want to consult uh, right here. So again, what I want to, how I want to summarize the social network part is that the critical success factors are a good network definition in terms of nodes. Nodes are usually straightforward. Edges are a lot more difficult, especially when we want to weigh them and especially when we want to weigh them in time. So that's a lot of experimental evaluation that comes with that. And then the next good thing is the next challenge is do good feature engineering because for networks, it's not garbage in, garbage out. It's garbage in and the garbage out is actually um, the exponential um, of the garbage out, right? So uh, it means that the effect of bad networks can uh, can be exponential. Okay, so um, in this presentation, we have there's there's some more things, but uh, I'm wrapping up right here. Obviously, there's also the effect of model risk, models being imperfect. Um, as ba George Box called it, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Also, still applies to modern day analytical models as well. So it's possible to outsmart models, to find loopholes in models, and actually to steal models using repetitive API calls as well. So in this very short presentation, because I have courses that span two days, and uh, in Soon I will teach a course together with SAS Malaysia in November, uh, a two-day course on fraud analytics. So in case you'd be interested to sign up for that course, you can send me an email. But we set the stage of fraud detection in this in this talk, indicated the importance thereof, the 5% number still remember, 5% uh, of the revenue that a firm loses due to fraud, introduced cost-sensitive logistic regression and the effect of including the business economics into the problem formulation, spoke about the crucial role of data engineering, like instance engineering and undersampling and smoothie, feature engineering, um, 
Benford's law. We spoke about social networks for fraud and how important it is to appropriately define them and featureize them. Do note, especially when you work in the, in the EU, the impact of data privacy and AI regulation like the EU AI Act, DSA Act. What this usually means is that it could hinder the fight against fraud, which obviously will can also further raise the premiums for the honest customers, which is um, an effect that it obviously um, creates. Good. Uh, with this, I would like to conclude my presentation. I hope you uh, learned a few new things and I'm, I'm happy to maybe, I see there's like 90 people or so. So I'm handling all questions may be a bit ambitious, but I may try and have a go. Yeah, you are totally right, Bart. It has been really a successful talk with lots of people attending. And um, yeah, for the people in the room, uh, I think we have, uh, yes, five minutes and uh, we can um, have uh, a couple of questions uh, being answered on the spot. And of course, you have the email from Bart and Bart has been happy to basically um, uh, offer new uh, places in which you can learn more about fraud analytics. So, um, yeah. So if you have any questions, you could, uh, yeah, raise your hand. I believe that you have now the right to unmute and um, share your screen. Or, uh, sorry, um, share your video. So feel free. In the meantime, I was quite keen to hear uh, about this uh, stealing from models by, uh, yeah. Yeah, so. it's called model theft. It's by if a model is exposed through an API, um, there's been some recent work that actually calls the API repetitively using very smart crafted features that allow that allows you to learn how the model behaves online. But So there's been some research on that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Which also allows you to detect the loopholes in the model, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any uh, questions from the audience? One has a question. I have a question. Cool. Thank you, uh, Aura. Was... <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to. Uh, um learn a little bit about your work because I've been following you on LinkedIn anyway. Uh, I'm very Thank interested you. in um, the work you're doing with uh, various companies. So uh, if you could maybe um, give a little bit of insight as to what fields do you think are, or what industries do you think are most challenging in terms of fraud prevention, uh, or if, you, if there's any particular industry that you're most interested in? Yeah, sure. Uh, we do a lot of work with uh, financial institutions, I can actually mention the names. We do work with BNP Paribas Fortis uh, on anti-money laundering. We've worked on um, uh, insurance fraud with AG Insurance and with uh, Allianz. We also done some work and also with um, KBC, which is a well-known Belgian and, inter um, and European bank. And uh, yeah, so we have re research collaborations with them and the purpose is to always kind of develop a, a new method because for us, the science is important and for them, the application is important. So for them, it has to really have added benefit as well, but that's a win-win for both. So we found that very fruitful. Thank you for your Thank question. You. Yeah. Is there any other question from the audience? Any more questions, guys? Well, that's going to be a tough one, yeah? That, that must, <laughs> must have been very clear. I think we are going... One more. Oh, yes, we one have. More. Oh, thank you very much. So uh, please go ahead, Sian. Yeah. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, I am Jan Mahmoud from uh, Kurdistan region in Iraq. Cool. Um, cool. Uh, I have master's degree in operational research, and uh, I'm going to like um, get a PhD in uh, uh, mixed uh, AI and machine learning with operations research, and that's why I I enjoyed uh, this uh, 
a series of seminars. Thank and you. I enjoyed your uh, uh, seminar. And uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, lots of things that you discussed uh, are new to me. And I have to read more about it. And uh, I can recommend this to you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 that's what I want. Uh, okay. I want uh, like your recommendation to to me to uh, to start to enter this uh, area to, to me to uh, like uh, 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 I mean increase my chance to get a in, PhD or uh, in fraud analytics or in machine learning in general. Um, I mean, uh, data science, you discuss data science and uh, you discussed lots of uh, areas uh, with operation research, uh, as I understood, uh, if I there's if some, I'm wrong. There's some very good courses that you can, some of them have been developed by an ex-PhD student of mine as well. There's a very good, I'm entering it into the chat. There's a very good course um, on uh, fraud analytics, which is available on DataCamp. It's, it's an online course. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, then if you want another learning platform where they have interesting courses, although I know machine learning courses, courses that I every now and then take, it's Udemy. But DataCamp has some very good fraud detection courses that I can recommend. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Thank you so much Thank you. Uh, for Thank the you. question. And I think we will need to leave it here because it's uh, 5.30 and uh, uh, we were very, very pleased that you, you could make it today. Okay. So... The audience, uh, please know that this has been recorded. Uh, so we will uh, be making this available in case you want to go through it again. Um, we are coming back in two weeks from now because next week is the inform. So we don't want to have a big clash with the informs conference. So in two weeks from now, we will have uh, Ruth Misener from Imperial College. And actually, in uh, three weeks from now, we will have a jam section so that you know that we are very pleased of having senior colleagues like uh, Ruth and Bart. But we are also very uh, keen in showcasing, uh, you know, the new blood of our OR and ML um, communities. So thank you so much for making it uh, possible because, I mean, it's the speakers, but also the organizers that make this alive. And we will be back, as I said, in two weeks from now. Thank you to everybody. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you so much. It has been a pleasure.